Sorry, I had to change the locations. As you can see, there's kids wandering around. Um, and I'm sorry for this very long lead-in since it's not what I, the main thing I have to say, but I thought it's good to kind of give an introduction. I guess I have more things than I thought I'd say on the subject of Star Wars. Anyway, like I said, after The Last Jedi, I was just like, okay, Star Wars is over. And also just my interest in it was over. So even though other things came out, I was just like, it's all done, you know. And I'd already been through the whole period of the great golden era of the extended universe. Like, I lived through the time of all the Jedi Knight games um, coming out when I was a little kid through it. And I remember being a kid um, and playing Dark Forces and all that stuff. And, of course, uh, playing... Um, well, I played tons of different video games, and we had all the books, all the Jedi Academy stuff, and, uh, of course, the Heir to the Empire trilogy, which I loved when I was a kid. Um, but I read, like, all of those, the Courtship of Princess Leia and you know, the Corellian stuff. I mean, there's there was a humongous amount of stuff, all the way into, like, the Yuuzhong Vong, and then I finally, when we got to the Yuuzhong Vong, I was like, okay, this is... Gone far enough, I uh, kind of peter, petered out here. I especially loved the stuff with um, uh, Exar Kun, and I did, I had like the, I was always like iffy on the canonic thing, because I always felt like it was kind of um, jumped the shark a bit with uh, the, what was it called? The, the the Dark Horse ones. I still have them. The, the Dark Horse comic books where Palpatine comes back. And it was funny because when I saw the third, like, Rise of Skywalker, it's like, this is like those comic books. You know, Palpatine's cloned himself. It's that whole thing again. In the same way, like, um, Kylo Ren, it's like, oh yeah, I remember from the extended universe when Jason went bad and became a Sith Lord. Um, except in that he at least had a sister to stop him. But in this case, we got Rey, Rey who kind of takes that role. And so... The Disney Star Wars stuff to me seemed to just be repeating stuff from the extended universe, but worse. You know, um, I really enjoyed the extended universe. Uh, I thought it was actually really great. Um, and so, having been through the, the high era of all that, I was like, all right, well, I don't need another one of that, but not as well thought through. Like, because at least those, I feel like they had pretty talented people. Um, you had George Lucas guiding, and it felt very Star Wars. It all fit together, continued the story well, and it did it for an enormous length of time um, in so many different mediums, uh, which was a ton of fun. And so, anyway, moving forward, we get to the Disney area. I stopped kind of following stuff. I watched the myth first season, The Mandalorian, parts of the second season, even parts of the third season, but with greatly declining interest. Um, Anyway, and I'm familiar with all the various directions they've gone with it. And so we finally arrive at the thing that I wanted to talk about, which was uh, Rosario Dawson, I think, got cast as Ahsoka. Her personality does not remind me very much of Ahsoka. Um, like a lot of people, I'm familiar with Ahsoka. I like Ahsoka. I didn't watch all of the Clone Wars. But I saw, yeah, a chunk of it, and I also saw a part of Rebels, and I've seen her on The Mandalorian. Um, yeah, I feel like the live-action version of her doesn't, doesn't have the same continuity or likability as the original Ahsoka, who is a much more, like, dynamic and dramatic person, and Rosario Dawson seems kind of like a, I don't know, kind of a laid-back, more stoic... Uh, she seems like someone who wouldn't be very talkative, you know? Whereas Ahsoka is this very dynamic, energetic sort of person. Anyway, my point is, I actually like the character of Ahsoka. All the Star Wars fans thought Ahsoka was great. They loved Ahsoka. They loved it when they brought Ahsoka back um, for, like, that season seven. Um, you know, everyone's super on board with Ahsoka. And there were all sorts of great characters in... Um, the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars series, as many people know, did an awesome job because it took the ideas and the situation, the world that George Lucas created, and was genuinely trying to follow it and be inspired by him and asking him for input, 
but you had the actual show running and the work and the technical stuff being done by somebody else. And I think that's why it turned out so well. Like the Clone Wars sh show shows you what the prequels could have been like if George Lucas had hired other people to direct it and just been the idea person. Um, so this is a case of it like, oh, actually this, the technical mistake was fixed. And now you have this whole rich world and situation and characters and things. And now someone can really do something with them. Um, but you've got that guidance. So then Disney got a hold of it. I'm a little skeptical about Ahsoka, the series. They're also trying to bring in Grand Admiral Thrawn and all some of that heir to the Empire stuff, things that were from um, Rebels, which I really appreciated that they did bring Thrawn into Rebels. He wasn't quite, not quite the same Thrawn, but he was like, that ah, good direction. You're going in the right way. This is, this is good. I'm glad you're bringing back this awesome character and making use of it. Um, that's a great idea. So I really appreciated that. Um, then... So what I actually want to talk about is just a comment that I saw. This is all. It's just celebrity gossip, and this is something I want to say. I have to try to explain to my girls, celebrities and actors are not the characters they're playing. Like, they aren't that person. They're people who have been hired to play that person. Sometimes, if it's an adaptation of something, they haven't seen any of the stuff. You know, it's like, you can't guarantee, they'll just like, eh, I don't like to have my own ideas on stuff. They haven't read any books. They haven't watched any of that stuff. They're just doing their job. Their job is to be successful as an actor. And a lot of the time that means stand where people tell you to stand um, and say the stuff people tell you to say. You know, I mean, ultimately, that's the job of an actor. It It is, it is work. Um... And although you do have some people like Henry Cavill who acts in stuff where he's like obsessed with it and it's like, this is the thing I want to make and they help get it made and they're an executive producer themselves and they're super deeply invested in like, I love this character because I read this book or I played this game and I want to help bring it to life. Yes, that happens, but that's actually not really that common. Um, even there's plenty of actors who do roles that they're famous for that they don't even like talking about it. They've never gone back and rewatched those movies. There's plenty of actors who have never gone back and rewatched that stuff. Um, they've moved on in their life. You know, it was a job or they, they don't even like discussing it. Harrison Ford's actually a great example. Does a fantastic job portraying Han Solo even in the Disney Star Wars, but definitely didn't want to do it. And like, it's like, this is, this is not my life being this character. I'm not Han Solo. I'm this actor, you know? And I saw him say a quote, which is like, that's a very Harrison quote, Ford quote. And it was someone asking him about, oh, what's it like playing Indiana Jones again? And he's just like, I don't care about that stuff. You care about that stuff. I'm just trying to get through my effing day. And that's like, well, that's how a lot of actors see it. Or they just see it, this is just a way to self-promote, you know. And so, especially when actors are... <coughs> Harrison Ford's more candid than most, <laughs> and maybe grumpier. A lot of actors are trying to play a game. They're trying to do self-promotion. They're trying to look good. So a ton of stuff they say in interviews is just inane babble. They're being asked stupid questions by stupid people reporting non-stories. It's just puff pieces for promotion. <laughs> They're not being asked real questions. They're just throwing out whatever answers they can come up with. They've got a hundred of these to do. Um, they don't particularly actually care about whatever the thing is. Like, it's like, Rosario Dawson, how much does she actually care about Star Wars? Like, not at all, probably. You know, did she even know who Ahsoka was before she was cast as Ahsoka? Probably not. Um, and that's fine. That's totally normal. As I said, people like who are really obsessed with a particular character and try to only do those characters that they're really obsessed with, very rare. You know, that is just not the way things usually work. Um, so she comes in and someone asked her and they're like, you know, why do you think people like Ahsoka and Hera and stuff like that much? And the truth is, it's a really tough question to put like her because to be honest, she probably never heard of Ahsoka or Hera or Sabine or any of those people 
until after she was hired, and she probably still wouldn't know those names if she hadn't had to literally work with other people where she had to say those names, you know? That's just the truth. It's like, she genuinely doesn't know about these things and doesn't really care about them. What she cares about is doing her job, being a successful actress, making the company look good, making herself look good. So when someone asked her a question like that, that's a really... Like I will say that is a genuinely hard question to ask her because if she was honest, she would be like Harrison Ford and just say, I don't care about that stuff. I don't know about that stuff. You guys care and know about that stuff. Not me. I'm just here to do my job. But she's nice and she's not like Harrison Ford. He feels like I'm old. I've already been super successful. I can be completely honest and grumpy, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Nobody, people will just have to live with it, you know? So he's at that position in his career where he can do that, but most actors aren't, um, and are less disagreeable too. So of course she has to answer something. And so her answer was, why do people love these characters so much? And she's like, oh, I think it's because, basically her answer was because of representation. She's like, oh, because they like them because they're female representation. Um, and to her credit, she was like, yeah, George Lucas and Dave Filoni have done a good job with representation. They're like female characters. There's always been female characters in Star Wars. In the same way, there's always been female action movie characters. It's just girls weren't watching them, so they don't know about them. Boys know about them because they actually like action in the same way they, they like Star Wars was mostly a boys' domain before Disney tried to kind of princess it up more. Um, but there were still a lot of great female characters who were loved, but they weren't loved because they were women. So the reason I thought that statement was uh, an interesting statement and worth talking about is because it's not only wrong, it's almost exactly wrong. Like it's, as I heard someone said, it's not incorrect, it's anti-truth. Like it's the exact opposite of the truth. And it's, it also helps explain why people like Ahsoka and why people don't like Rey. The reason people don't like Rey to a certain chunk is because of representation. And by that, I mean, she's a, where you're supposed to like and endorse and be into a character simply because of who they are, because they are a woman or because they are a man or whatever it is, or because they are this, because they are that. Um, and that's exactly the opposite. Like, when Ahsoka wasn't, was introduced, she wasn't introduced as, here is a girl character, therefore you must like her, and so all the Star Wars fans got on board. And they said, ooh, here is Hera, or here is Sabine, and that's why all these classic, because these are characters that are loved by the long-standing, what we're told is horribly misogynistic fan base because they didn't embrace Rey or uh rose tico and it's like oh well they're a bunch of um, woman haters you know these old star wars fan base and star wars has this deep history of misogyny um <clears throat> and they're all basement dwelling um trolls and it's like uh but they love ahsoka and they love princess leia they love mara jade they they love Hera, and it's like well how do you explain these two things and when you come in and say Representation is why they like Ahsoka. It's such a perfect answer because it's exactly perfectly wrong. Representation was completely absent from those characters. So the reason people like Ahsoka is because she's a good character. Like, you weren't supposed to like her because she was a girl. You liked Ahsoka and she was a girl. Like, no one was blackmailing you into liking her because she was this or because she was that. People liked all of those characters emergently. They liked them because they were likable. People liked Sabine and Hera and especially Ahsoka because they were likable. People didn't like, like especially boys didn't like Princess Leia because she was a girl. She was a girl. That was a big part of her character but you weren't told that you had to like her because she was a girl. You liked her because she was a sassy, fun, um, funny, commanding, like she was just a super fun character. You just liked her. No one said you have to like her. You, I'm putting her in here for her to be liked. 
Like, you can just distribute things and people like it. Like, Star Wars is just, and this is part of the problem with the way people look at Star Wars. It's like, well, fans are just dummies who just like Star Wars stuff, whatever, because they don't understand what's likable about Star Wars. They don't actually know. They don't care. They're just like, fans just like Star Wars things. They like, they like the things that are Star Wars. And so we'll just hand out a bit of Star Wars to this person, and then people will like them. Um, no. People like Star Wars because of qualities that had that made it likable. So you can't just hand out the likability of Star Wars in a distributive model. This is something I've talked about in many other cases. The problem is they're using the distributive model of understanding things instead of the productive model. Where it's like people don't like... A role isn't great because you just handed that person a piece of Star Wars. And you can't just give someone something it has to be produced so the likability of ahsoka was produced by her qualities as a character because she was fun she was funny she was spunky she was eager she was a little over eager she had this tension with her master she had this big falling out she had her own personal journey that she went through she went through a lot she went through a lot of personal growth and the people were really rooting for her to like let's see this little person grow up and wow look at who she has become by the end it's amazing and then the thing that is exactly wrong with ray is that you have someone come along where you're like i don't even know who this is you took like three movies to even tell me who she was, and frankly, it was a little iffy, and it's like, what? And um, I never really figured out what she wanted or who she was as a person. She never seemed to have that much of a character arc. She always won every confrontation she ever had. She never, she was always good at everything. Like, she just wasn't an interesting character, but we're like, well, but we gave her some Star Wars, so you should like her, right? She's doing the Star Wars stuff. She's swinging the lightsaber. Don't you like her? Isn't she badass? And it's like, no, it's not that simple. Um, you haven't actually tried to understand the thing you're trying to sell or the characters you're trying to do, and you think you can just, like, pour it into any vessel, and it's like, that will then contain the thing. And at the same time, they're like, well, and we just... You have to like her because she's a woman. And it's like, well, why? Why does that mean we have to like her? That doesn't make her interesting. Half the species is a woman. It's not like characters that are men are interesting just because they're men or good just because they're men. There's, You don't like Lando Calrissian or Han Solo because they're men. <clears throat> you like them because... They're fun characters. They're interesting. Lando Calrissian is charming. He's funny. He's hard to read. He's really slick, but has this other side to him. You see him grow as a character, kind of like Han Solo, where he goes from being kind of like, ooh, I did something, and then I regret it, and now, now I'm kind of going completely the other way. And then Han Solo, same thing. Completely out for himself, go through this whole personal growth, ends up getting invested in people, um, <clears throat> has this, you know, romance, so many things that happen, is willing to let his romance go, even in Return of the Jedi, for the sake of happiness, when he thinks Leia's in love with Luke, and he doesn't know what's actually going on. Like, you're like, oh, there was a good character there, being portrayed, you know, dynamically. And I will say, I think Daisy Ridley was actually very good at playing the role. She's a very charismatic person. They just gave her, like, nothing to work with like the people who are crafting the story just didn't understand star wars and didn't understand storytelling and inadvertently made her like super boring um and just not like not interesting and in many ways like deliberately annoying especially when this is uh an interesting aside so all different types of societies have positives and negatives one thing about a lot of male societies, and I had to experience this with fifth graders, is they can be extremely meritocratic and can have a lot of pushback. They are not very interested in including people. Um, often when you try to enter into the group, the immediate instinct is to push back on you hard. They're not like, come in, we're here to welcome you, we're here to make space for you. Instead, they basically do the opposite. They push back and are more asking questions, can you carve out a 
place for yourself? Can you fight for it? Can you prove that you have a right to be here? Can you take some pretty hard pushback and hard headwinds and ribbing and teasing in order to be welcomed into the group? And boys will tease each other a lot too and they'll also compete pretty hard. But if you are like, I can take it and I can also dish it, it's like, all right, then you're part of us. And so there's a lot of negativity. And uh, I remember watching the boys, boys play football and some of the girls got real mad because one of the boys got hurt bad enough that he cried. And the girls were like, what is wrong with you? Don't you see that you're hurt? He's hurt and he's crying. And the boys were all just kind of like strategically avoiding it. And it's like, well... I tried to help them both understand. The boys and girls both ended up getting mad at each other. The boys, because they're like, the girls don't understand and the girls are interfering. Um, and we're uncomfortable with, with that. And the girls are like, we don't like the way you're doing things. And we're not comfortable with that. And I think there's things to be heard on both sides because both can go to their extremes. Um, I tried to explain to the boys, like, the girls are trying to be helpful here. They're help trying to say, hey, maybe have a little more consciousness of this. Hey, there's room to, to, to be a little more caring and a little more like, hey, how can we all keep us together and make sure everyone's having a good time? Um, <clears throat> and the boys are like, playing the game. This is part of what we all agree to in playing the game. We're all going to play. We're all going to play hard. We're all going to play fair. The thing that happened to that person was allowable within the rules. And if that happens to you, it happens. We've all consented to it. These are the rules we're all playing by. Any of us could have that happen to us. And if it does happen, we all sort of strategically ignore it, you know, and, and give you the dignity of being like, well, when you pull yourself together and you're ready to come back and play, boom, you can jump right back in. And I did watch a kid once who got knocked down, got hurt pretty bad. He got hit in like the face. He had blood all down his face. And he was kind of teary. I sent him to the nurse. He came back. And within like one minute, he was back shooting the baskets, having a great time. And none of the boys ever acknowledged that any of this ever happened. Um, and they all just moved right on. But the girls were very unhappy about it. And the girls were also the one who helped take him to the nurse. And I was like, hey, you know what? Actually, I think there's a good system here. You've got the two tensions. You've got the two extremes. They're filling in each other's sort of gaps. Um, anyway, as a, the, what I meant to bring that in is <sighs> boy society can be very negative in many ways. A lot of the negativity is part of its design. It's meant to test you. It's meant to see, can we rely on you? Can you keep it together? Can you control yourself? Can you give it? Can you take it? Can I trust you? And that's how they do things. That's how they do things. They test your trustworthiness and reliability in very different ways than how girls test trustworthiness and reliability. It's almost like they test it with anti-social action against you rather than pro-social demands on you. Um, you know, it's more, can you play by the rules of this game? Girls are also asking that, they just have different rules. Can you play by the rules of this game? But the nice thing about it is it is very meritocratic. And then it's like, well, if you can be awesome, we don't care who you are. Like, we're not going to like Lando Calrissian because he's black. Mm -mm. But if you are black and you are awesome, we're going to think you're awesome and take you right to our bosom. You will be 100% part of the group. You will be beloved. So that's the upside of the sort of... Um, meritocratic thing. Same thing, it's like, we're not going to like you because we're told we have to, because you're a girl, right? But if you are awesome, Ahsoka, we don't care that you're a girl, even if most of us are boys. If you are awesome, you're in with us. So that's the positive thing about it, is if you can earn your way in, anyone can earn their way in from any position um, and be super accepted and beloved. You just have to earn it. It can't be handed out. That's not, that's not the way that, that guys do things. They don't hand things out. They don't hand out positions. You could get any position you want if you're good enough for it, if you earn it. The positions are not getting handed out. Um, and there are cases where it's like, you do need some handing out. You do need some help. You do need some like trying to keep things together and 
someone needs to be conscious. Well, what do we do about the people that get hurt? What about the people who couldn't manage to play? Is there anything we can do to help with them? You know, what, are, where, how can we assist them? What can we get them involved in? What can we make them part of? That can be taken to extremes. And I think what you see with some of Star Wars and especially the representation arguments is like the negative extreme of that. Or it's like, well, you have to like this because we handed the Star Wars to this person. We distributed it. Um, and if you don't like it or have any arguments about why you don't, you are super evil. You are against us. Um, and as I said, I think that's just misunderstanding Star Wars. It's misunderstanding what makes people like Star Wars. People don't just like Star Wars because it's Star Wars. They actually like things about it. Compelling stories, reaching into deep archetypal things, and um, really compelling characters. Like, well, if you take away the deeply coherent archetypal stuff that George Lucas built in, and you take away what's interesting and fun about the characters, and just say, it's Star Wars, like it. It's a girl doing Star Wars, like it. It's a this doing Star Wars, like it. Like, that's not going to work. Ahsoka is beloved because she earned her place in Star Wars. She is caught up into the big archetypal thing, and she is also individually like a super compelling character. Probably the best character to come out of post-prequel Star Wars. Um, yeah, probably the best, strongest character. Um, so it's amazing. Um, but then you hand that off to, uh, some actress who, to be honest, like I said, it's understandable. She probably doesn't know about Star Wars. She probably doesn't care about it. She probably had no clue who Ahsoka was or these other characters. Um, they're not going to mean anything to her when the job is over unless somehow she can further her career even more with it and get more jobs with it, then sure. She'll probably try to do her best job, I'm sure, acting and doing whatever it is she's she's trying to do. But we do have this problem of like, well, is there currently anyone there working on it who actually understands the character? Because you do need someone who understands the character and someone who understands why people like her so that you can keep doing those things. Hopefully... Um, people like Filoni are still having that influence to try and keep that going. But anyway, I've gone on very long. My point was just to say it was such a remarkable thing to see this person, but totally understandable when someone asked her, why do people like Ahsoka, uh, including, as I said, old, old legacy Star Wars fans that have been there through the whole thing, through the last 40 years, why do these people like Ahsoka and Hera and Satine, whoever? And it's like, well because of representation which basically means because they were women and someone gave them a bit of the star wars that's like nope that is wrong on all counts and also explains why so much of what was done in disney star wars has annoyed legacy fans because they're trying to engage the fandom in a totally alien manner of just as i said this we're going to dish out some star wars to you now and you're going to like it and we're going to do some representation now, and you're going to like it because of that. Representation is really just tribalism with some better PR. I mean, that's all it is. It's just saying, like someone because they're a this. Not because of any specific content of character or quality. We can just hand out goodness. We can just distribute it. We can. The goodness of things is just, it's the Star Wars. We don't... And or, or whatever the franchise is, and we can just pass it out to any person, and you're going to like it, and you're going to also like it because it was passed out to this person, not because of any really compelling qualities or continuation of the things that made you first fall in love with that franchise, with Star Wars, or with whatever it is. Um, you know, we're, we're not concerned about that. We think it's just things that can be handed out that we just assume exist. They don't think they have to produce it. They don't actually, They would even if they knew that it had to be produced, I don't think they would know how because they don't know what it was. And they haven't really been that interested to even know what was it that made it work. And that's the case also. You watch a lot of like the live action remakes that are so much duller uh, than the original Disney things. Like, well, for one thing, you're not getting good creative people who are going to want to work on something that is basically just a rehash of something that's already been done. In some cases, a really slavish rehash. And it's like, well, the only thing we can come up with is to say, 
well, we we gave that part to a, this person. Representation. It's like, so the only thing you added to it was a little tribalism with some good PR to make it sound nice. It's like that. That's not why we liked the thing. It's not like we liked, you know, Jasmine because she was played by this or that person. Most people have absolutely no idea. You know, it's not like people liked Ariel because Jody Benson, who was like a white redheaded person, played her. Most people have no idea who Jody Benson is. They found an actually compelling character to like. Um, and so saying this will be awesome because we made her uh, this is just like, ooh, anyone who even tries to advance that argument is coming to this story from such a shallow understanding of what it is and what made people like it. You just know it's not going to be very interesting. It might not be terrible because it's still going to be, well, you're stealing from a great work of art and you're rehashing a great work of art. And so you probably get something decent out of it because it's like, well, you melted down something beautiful made of gold and you're hammering it into some vague imitation of it. It's like, well, it'll still probably be somewhat nice because you're still using gold and you're still trying to hammer it into this imitation of this thing that people love, but it's not going to be a great creative act and you're not going to get something fantastic out of it. And that is, I think, why so many of the remakes have this sense of like, I sense the people in this just saw this as a thing people like that they can sell again. They don't actually understand why it works or how it works or what people liked about it. And they're not really interested. And they probably didn't even look at it that much beforehand. Um, watching remakes of stuff, the Disney remakes in particular, I often get the impression of like, I guarantee the people who made this movie have thought way less about it than me. That's not a good thing to think because stuff will happen that's even just like, do you even understand how that small change you just made like wrecked something about the plot? Like even just watching something like, uh, we were watching a scene from the new Little Mermaid recently, like in where Ursula is doing her song and she's like, she's trying to win Ariel over and there's some suspension of disbelief involved and Ariel is being foolish, but she's being, she's mad at the time. She's deliberately, in the old movie, she's trying to do something transgressive. She knows she's doing something transgressive and she does it with a sense of rebellion, not stupidity. In the same way, it's like, well, she's a teenager. That's the point. She's being a bratty teenager and her dad is having a hard time and he's being kind of a difficult dad of a teenager. And actually, the real story is about the two of them realizing, oh, we both made some mistakes. We didn't do a good job communicating or understanding each other. And ultimately, a lot of the core of that movie is actually just the healing of a parental relationship. And it's telling this very universal story of the struggles that parents have of parenting a teenager and that a teenager has of being parented and making it through that transition. The mistakes that can be made, the parents' attempts to prevent those mistakes, uh, and that push and pull between them, and then both of them kind of recognizing, wow, we made some mistakes, we both regret them, and we're both willing to like pay the price, including for each other. You know, it's like the things they will do for each other because they realize, oh, we do love each other, we both wronged each other, and Triton's willing to give up his kingdom and his life for his daughter. You know, and Ariel, she feels great regret. She's willing to risk her life to try and set things right too. And so you have this, the reconciliation ultimately is between father and daughter. Now, the romance is part of that, but it's really the story of a teenage girl going through the process of growing up and finding out how to both separate herself from her parents and her parents being able to handle that while also like negotiating into some sort of balanced uh, relationship where they're still communicating and helping each other. <laughs> Why did I bring that up? Oh yes, so Ar uh, Ursula's singing and she is trying to kind of convince Ariel and she's like the lonely and depressed. And in the original, she does it as an aside to her eels. She's like pathetic. And so it's like, oh, that's what she really thinks, which is in contrast to what she's singing, which is, I'm helping people, I'm nice. But in the modern one, she's just like, I help the lonely and depressed, pathetic. And she says it right to Ariel's face. There's no longer a divide between 
the appearance I'm putting on and the reality of what I think. Like, they completely lost that. And it's like, whoever made this didn't bother understanding the plot sufficiently to realize there's a big difference between pathetic and pathetic when the person you're trying to trick is sitting right in front of you. That's just like one microcosmic example, but there's a ton of little examples like that throughout the live action ones where you're just like, whoever made this didn't bother understanding it enough to like see what things did or why they mattered. They just saw play song, aerial, octopus, fun words, people here. People already know the song. Let's just play it again. But maybe we'll have a different person do it, you know? Um, but they don't get it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of modern Disney stuff reflects this kind of rehashed lack of creativity where it's all the majority of everything they release now is just either rehashing their own stuff that they made in their golden productive era or buy someone else's creative product and then try to keep making money off of that. But the longer it sits in their hands um, with these people who don't understand it and they're like, well, buy Star Wars or we'll buy Indiana Jones and then we can just exploit it for money. But they don't actually understand it. They don't actually care about it. They didn't make it. And it ends up gradually reflecting their own internal tone um, and limitations. And so things end up kind of falling apart. Anyway, I felt like that comment was very illustrative of both, as I said, understanding that actors aren't the characters they portray, um, that they don't necessarily know or care about the things that they are working on. Some of them do, but some of them, they're just there to do the job and self-promote and say whatever works with the little dance of promotion and looking good in front of the hundreds of interviews that they have to do. And that you can buy products and then try to distribute them and use them and exploit them, but over time it degrades them because you're not actually producing, you're not investing into them in the right way. And you can have enormous amounts of technical skill, but there's also something beneath it all. There's some sort of soul. There's a spirit of creativity, the thing that animates it, the thing that animates and gives flower to all this. And you want the competent, productive people to be working on it. But if you don't have that soul, you end up with stuff that's just like, that wasn't bad. It was okay. And then you kind of forget about it. And you're like, oh, that was all right. I was kind of entertained, whatever. But it doesn't have the same impact. Um, I think we can see why that's happening um, with these with these companies. With Disney in particular, I feel like they have lost their creativity and kind of hired the wrong people and hired them for the wrong reasons. Um, and if you're hiring people for... And that's part of the problem, too, is that they hired a lot of people internally for representation reasons. And it's like, well, those people are just going to, that's a very shallow reason to hire people. And they're just going to perpetuate that problem, this problem of this distributive way of looking at things and this shallow tribalistic way of looking at value um, that people don't really enjoy and is actually antagonistic to the old products and to the people who like them because they can sense like uh, you don't actually get what was likable about these stories or these characters and you're just demanding that I like them or whatever you do with them or whoever you give them to and then I'm supposed to be happy with that and as I said especially with certain male audiences they really push back on that because they don't like that sense of social obligation um, because that's not the game they play. They don't feel like they should have to give you a position or have to let you play just because you asked for it or that it should be handed out. They really, really demand that you earn it. And you can see that as a negative or you can see that as a positive. Um, anyway, that was a very long and wandering way to talk about something that I probably could have summarized in five minutes. That's all for today. Thanks.